I want to jump into and, and get started with stuff. We got a bunch of people in this room with a bunch of different backgrounds and talents. I was thinking about that during worship. Um, we have a really cool, talented band, like all students, plus Parker. Um, that was like cool to, to worship with you guys tonight. What other kinds of skills do you guys have? Like, what would you say, like, oh, there's, here's some unique skill that I have, something that I've like, something I'm good at. What would you say? Unique skills that you guys have. I want to actually know. This is like a real question. Yes. I can handle babies crying Okay, so really good with babies and children, specifically crying ones. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Graphic design. That's very cool. Is this a real answer? You're good at pedaling uphill. Okay. You have working legs. Good job. Yeah. Eating. Uh, that's like a pretty basic like life skill. Uh, I'm not calling on either of you. Um, Chaz. Shh. Hey, hold on. Listen up. I want to hear these answers. Martial arts. All right. Respect. Respect. Now everybody's going to want to fight you. Um, Daniel, what are you good at? Piano. piano. Oh, I'm jealous. All of my life, I wish that I could be good at piano. Isaac. Kettlebell workouts. All right. Now, all right, you can put your hands down. Now, I think, I think of my own life, like high school John. I don't know what things, I like, there's nothing I can point back to. I'm like, oh, I was good at that in high school. Um, maybe certain video games. I don't like, there's not very much, but I've seen lots of high school students that are skilled at a lot of different things. Some of those things, I'd love to see some of those skills, um, happening. Um, there was a time that, uh, Kendamas had like a chokehold on America. Uh, do you guys remember, you guys remember that? I don't know what grade you were in when that started. Um, now, all right, all right, hold on, shh. I saw when this, when this epidemic took place, I saw a bunch of students that were absurdly skilled with this. And it made me laugh when this became like famous uh, because if you didn't know the little known fact about me, John Uyoa, uh, I'm Mexican. So my, my like... Small, I know, shocker. My small Mexican childhood, shh, I grew up like going to Mexico, seeing family, just like vacations down there. And in Mexico, when I was a kid, like they sell these in line at the border. It's just like a common like poor person's toy in Mexico. So then when it got popular here and you guys were spending like hundreds of dollars on some custom, I, my mind was just like blown. But... During that time, I saw a bunch of students that were absurdly skilled with these things that could do all kinds of ridiculous things that like, I don't, I don't even know how you did that, but were very, very good at it. One of the things that I dabbled in when I was younger, and I've seen some, some students be decent at it, it's called flipping. Um, it originated with butterfly knives, but they sell practice versions, non-illegal versions of them. Uh, do you have that next picture? So um, I, I, for a minute, I, I bought a practice blade butterfly knife like this and just like practice a lot. And at a certain point, I was like, okay, like I can do certain things. Some people are ridiculous. If you just want to be entertained, watch like skilled flipping videos. Um, it's crazy what people can do. Um, for some of you guys, as another, uh, I hesitate to call it a skill, but in reality, it, it is some kind of skill. Uh, can you put up the next one? Okay. Fortnite. I will say, I will say. Listen up, listen up. I have never played Fortnite once in my whole life. But I know if I did, if I did, I would be really bad. I would die really quick. I wouldn't know how to build stuff or what to do or where to run. 
But some students have every single cranny of every single map memorized and know the statistics of if I wait here in the beginning versus if I'm here and, and what to use and where to hide and exactly when to do what. And so I'll be honest, there are some people that like, oh, you exhibit a level of skill at this game. Now, there are some skills that when you get older, you're not going to be like, yeah, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I remember. I remember when that was a really big part of my life, and that's embarrassing. Um, that being said, though, whatever your skills are, you guys all mentioned some different things. Um, I, I'm impressed, piano, graphic design, like these different things. You guys have grown in those skills because, just like the Kendama kids, you guys practiced a lot. Um, I knew some of the Kendama kids in our youth ministry. There was nowhere that they were that they were not flipping that stupid thing every single place that they went. Um, just out in public, eating food, at home, in the car, always practicing. We, all the things that we are good at, anything that we could say we have a skill in, maybe a sport that you're skilled in, maybe you're skilled in lifting weights, whatever it is, all those things are things that you have practiced at, that you have gotten good at. There's, there's almost nothing that you are just naturally exceptional at. Even if you have raw talent, there's still skills and things that need to be honed, things that need to be developed. Some of those things that you got really good at, maybe you weren't trying, maybe you didn't like set a schedule for I'm going to practice Kendama, but yet still you practiced, you developed routines and habits and discipline. And the outcome of that was I got good at this thing. I got good at martial arts. I got good at <laughs> pedaling uphill or whatever, whatever your things are. Like you developed those things. Here's what I want to talk about tonight. In our spiritual lives, so much of the growth that is ever going to happen, ever, in our spiritual life, it's going to happen because we are intentional, because we are forming habits and disciplines with the help of the Holy Spirit to become more like Christ. Being, being a strong or mature Christian does not happen to any single human being by accident. You will never reap the fruit of a relationship with God just by accident. There's so much that God has for you, so much he designed you for, a life he created you for that is beyond and so much better than anything you could ask, think, or imagine. But the key to it is cultivating that spiritual life. It's through, it's through practice, discipline. We don't grow on our own without trying. As a matter of fact, if we are not trying, the opposite is happening. Not only are we not growing, we are going to spiritually wither. We're going to spiritually die if we are not trying to grow. That's just kind of how it works. And that's not, that's not on you. That's on every single one of us. Why? Because we have this sin nature that loves the wrong things. And if, if I'm not walking with the Lord and he's not helping me to do right, my nature is going to take me the opposite way. Uh, it doesn't matter that I gave my life to the Lord in 2004 and it's been 19 years. That same sinful nature in me then exists in me now. I'm redeemed. I'm saved. God has, God has done miracles in my appetites and helped me in so many ways, yet I still have a sin nature. And if I am not intentional to seek God, if I'm not intentional to develop healthy habits in my life, my natural bent is I like sin and I'm going to do that if I'm not building healthy habits. Again, we don't grow on our own without trying. First Corinthians chapter three, Paul's speaking to Christians He's speaking to believers in Corinth, and he says, and I could not speak to you like you were spiritual men or spiritual adults, but as to men of flesh, I had to speak to you like you were infants or babies in Christ. And he says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, 
because you weren't able to receive it. Even now, you're not yet able. Uh, I know most of you guys are aware, babies can't eat solid food. They have to grow and develop. That's why, at first, all that they can subsist on is either breast milk or formula because their bodies can't process anything else. You just try to feed your baby some grapes, uh, your baby's going to like choke or die. It's not going to work out for them. Um, babies are unable. They are unable to process anything else. And so Paul is comparing these Christians. He's like, you're like spiritual babies. He says, I couldn't give you, I couldn't give you real food to eat. And he's not talking about feeding them. He's saying, there are spiritual principles that I want you to understand, things I want to teach you, ways that I want you to grow. And he's like, but I can't do it. I can't teach you them. You're not ready for them. You're too spiritually immature, and so I have to spoon feed you. I have to simplify things. Milk is just this most basic element of basic nutrition for life. And so what Paul was like, he's like, I have to just give you the most basic fundamental things because you're not ready for anything else. And what Paul is saying is he's saying you should have been ready for something else. You should have matured more to this point where I could teach you and help you where you could understand some more solid things about the word of God. And he's like, but I can't. Even now, you're not yet able. And he told them, you're still in the flesh. And so it kept them from understanding God's word better. There's a saying, and it's, watch your thoughts because they become your words. Watch your words because they become your actions. Watch your actions because they become your habits. Watch your habits because they become your character, and watch your character because it becomes your destiny. It leads you to your future. The reason I bring this up, you know, last year I talked about what do we want to be known for as we start this school year. Um, and this, this season, it's a cool one. It's a cool time of transition. Whatever, whatever your life and schedules and stuff was during the summer is all pretty drastically different once the school year starts. Whether you're homeschooled or at school five days a week, your schedule's looking different. For some of us, that means more like normality. That might mean more busyness. It might mean you can't sleep in until like two o'clock every day. Um, but in this season, I want to encourage you guys, and this is everything I'm sharing about tonight, is because I want to encourage you to maybe choose to engage in some new actions and develop some new habits. This is the perfect time for it. This, you, this cool change in season is an ideal time for any of us to decide, I want to make some changes. I want to do some stuff differently this year, starting with the school year. One of the reasons that New Year's resolutions exist, it's not because there's anything special about January. It's just... The start of a calendar, people are like, oh, it's kind of a change. It makes sense for me to try to do something new now. And so all around the world, people make decisions of like, I want to make some changes. I want to do some different things. Now, whether or not they walk those out and like are consistent, that's a whole nother thing. Um, but we have the opportunity. That door is open anytime. Anytime, I want you to know you can decide that you can make changes in your life. That door is open to you at all times. You don't have to wait for a new calendar year or school to start. You don't have to wait till youth group, till you can have someone pray for you. Any moment of any day, you can decide, Lord, I want to do some things differently. God, I, I need help. I want to make changes. But discipline, discipline involves us dying to ourself. It's us growing in self-control and deciding that something else is worth more than just our own convenience, sometimes more, worth more than our current feelings. But disciplining of ourselves and working to develop godly habits, that's a, that's a goal for our life. And that's not something that, by the way, like what I'm talking about is not just, oh, you just do this freshman year, or you just do this senior year, or when you're in high school. Every single adult in this room, all of us are having to still figure out, what does it look like for me to cultivate godly habits in my life? What does it look like for me to be serious about growing with God and not just coasting, not just thinking, ah, oh, it'll work out, because it won't. 
Just like anything in your life that you've gotten good at, it took you practice. It took you time. It took you commitment. I say this regularly, and I'll say it again. Like, you, you people who, like, take sports seriously, um, some of you guys are casual athletes. You're, I get you. The people that are real serious about sports, like, I don't get it, but I respect the discipline and the self-control that you guys have. The, like, the, no, serious athletes. Um, I'm just joking. <laughs> But, hey, for real, for real, shh. This includes, Paul, you're in this category, but, all, but you guys, for real, listen up, shh. Every one of you guys, you, you like committed athletes. Dude, I watch you guys exercise insane discipline that I never had in high school. I watch you guys die to your own desires regularly. I was... Uh, talking with a student that I mentor last week. We were like making plans and it was like, oh, hey, what's your schedule? And he's like, oh, I have volleyball at six o'clock in the morning on Monday on Labor Day. And I was like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. <laughs> Any coach tells me that I practice at six o'clock in the morning on Labor Day. By the way, their school had not even started yet. I'm like, nope. Like, I am not, I don't care what sport it is. I don't care about, like, I'm not doing that. Um, now, if you, for, and this is not just athletes, whatever things you guys are committed to, you guys sacrifice a lot. And I realize, like, it's not that high school students don't know how to be disciplined. You guys do. You guys exercise crazy discipline. You guys build incredible habits, but often not focused on spiritual growth. Often that discipline isn't exerted to, how can I seek God and be more like him? And I think if it was, man, what would that look like? What would that look like to have that kind of discipline? To, to be intentional about developing habits that you knew were going to benefit you spiritually and making those a high priority in your life the way that we do all kinds of other things. 1 Timothy 4.7, it says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. There's all kinds of ways that we can discipline our bodies. There's all kinds of uh, habits that we can form that are, are fine, whatever physical things we're doing. But godliness is profitable for all things because it holds promise for this present life and also the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance the ending is just a way for the author to be like, hey, what I just said is really important and really matters, and you should pay attention. Discipline yourself for godliness, because every other discipline that you could possibly discipline yourself for, he says, it's actually of little profit. Not that it doesn't matter, not that every other discipline that you exercise is worthless, but he says, when you compare it to godliness, godliness is profitable for all things, not just in your life day to day right now, but then also for all eternity. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so this verse, God's saying, don't be like the world. All right, that's clear, but be transformed. That sounds real deep and real serious. And that's one of those things of like, Cool, but how do I do that? And he spells out the way you're going to do that is by renewing your mind. Now, we don't often think up like that. Very often, I, I think the idea we have about like, if we're going to really be transformed to be like Jesus, if we're really going to like be a solid Christian, it's going to be because we fell on our face down at the altar at Future Quest or because we made a really big decision at camp. Or because of that one time someone prayed over us and we fell over. That's not, that's not what it looks like to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Those things are great. God will use those things. But real transformation comes, that renewal of our mind, I want to I wanna break that down. Really what that's going to look like is developing godly habits and practices in your life. That is how you renew your mind. 
That's how you get transformed. Every single Christian that you guys know who you, you recognize, like, oh, that person's been transformed. They're different. They're, they're living for God in some way that I'm not, or I, I respect them. They have solid faith. They are, you know, useful in God's kingdom. It's because they've learned how to renew their minds because they've learned what it looks like to develop godly habits and practices. And I want to be real clear. I'm not going to spell out what are, what are all the godly habits and practices because most weeks we're talking about those. And when you guys start meeting in your small groups next week, those will regularly come up. So I know that most of you guys know those answers, but we somehow feel like we don't have to get used to practicing them. We think that that like godliness is just going to fall on us, that we're just going to pray or our parents are going to pray, and then we're just going to wake up when we're 18 or when we're married or when we have kids, and all, just one day we're going to be godly. One day we're going to be these mature Christians. That doesn't happen to anybody. We don't accidentally mature. It's the renewing of our mind, again, developing godly habits and practices. The cool thing is I don't care where you're at. I don't care if you are here for your very first time ever and you've never heard anything about God or if you've been raised in church your entire life. If you want to, you can decide tonight, I want to cultivate godly habits in my life. I want to walk out renewing my mind. There's no point where you're disqualified from doing that. It's not like, oh, well, you messed up too much. Oh, nope, you took too long. You can't do it now. At whatever moment you guys want, you can decide, all right, I want to take this seriously. I want, to, I want to put a plan into action to make this a part of my life. What's cool is the way that God designed us, he designed our body and our brains to work in a way to help us do that. Our brains are insane. We don't, under, we don't fully understand how our brains work. Scientists all around the world from the beginning of time have been trying to study and understand human behavior, why we do what we do, how our brains are like functioning and, and all of that. And so a lot of time has been devoted to studying habits because habits dictate people's entire life. They do. And so scientists want to know why do people do what they do and what do habits have to do with that? And I've learned Developing habits completely changes the wiring of our brain. It changes the way our bodies physically respond to things based on habits that we form. It's something that, again, it, it gets developed. You don't just wake up and you have a habit all of a sudden. A habit always follows this process where... There's a cue, there's a, there's a beginning, there's a thought. And then beyond that, there's a craving. There's a, oh, there's something that I want on the other end of this. There's a response, okay, I'm gonna do something about it. And then there's the reward, what I get from it. A bunch of you guys on your way in, you stopped and ate a burger. Um, you did not think, a lot of you consciously, you weren't like, you know what? I'm experiencing hunger right now. You know what would solve hunger is ingesting that meat patty over there. I should go over there to get that meat patty and then eat it to satisfy the hunger that I feel because then I would feel, none of you did that. You were just like, oh, there's food. Oh, there's a burger. I'm hungry. I'm eating it. You don't know the reason, the reason all that happened is because you have learned there's been a habit that has developed in your life where you understand, oh, I experience hunger. I desire to have my hunger satisfied. I've learned that eating things satisfies that hunger. I've learned for some of us, burgers especially, like, oh, I feel good when I eat that. I enjoy that. And so the response, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to eat it. The reward, I'm now full. There's like dopamine releases chemicals. There's chemicals in my brain that are released that make me feel happy. And it's like, cool. So much of our life is that cycle in our brain that we are not even realizing we're doing. Because so much of our life, again, God made 
God made it easy for us to develop habits to be a blessing to us so that we could develop healthy habits to help us to live rightly. But just like every other thing in the world, the enemy takes what God designed for good and corrupts it. So we can also develop bad habits. But it does take time. Do we have that graphic for that habit loop? So this is kind of the way that it works. And so much of human behavior is just this wheel right here. What, what is motivating me? What do I want? I respond to it. There's some kind of reward. And I've learned that. And it happens so much that we stop thinking about it. We develop habits even if we don't mean to. It makes me think, uh, how many of you guys drive? Okay. Uh, legally. A bunch of hands go down. Um, okay. When you start driving, especially once you're driving a long time, you'll find, and it's scary, it freaks me out every time, that I can drive, and depending on where I'm going or what I'm doing, my body will enter an autopilot mode where I'm not consciously thinking about anything. And when I exit that autopilot mode, I like come to my senses and I'm like, I don't even know what, what was even happening for the last five minutes. I don't remember how I got here. I, don't, I can't tell you one car that I saw or what song I listened to. My brain was just like, oh, focus. What happens a lot of times for me, I come to church every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and what will be happening is I'll be driving to go somewhere else, and then I'll, like, exit my stupor, and I'll be like, oh, I'm, like, I'm here at church. I, my body autopiloted me to church because I've learned, oh, when I'm driving in this area, this is where I go. And now my body just, I do it instinctively, and it's scary that, like, that can happen without us, like, realizing it. But it does, and it's crazy, the power of habits. Even driving is, can be, is a habit. Um, but it's happened in such a way that like, I'm not even aware that I'm doing it, and my body just takes me here, and now I'm in the wrong place. It happens all the time. There's beauty and power in how God designed us to form habits. Now, I want to say this. All I want to do tonight is I want to motivate you guys. I want to encourage you to figure out what would it look like for you to choose to start developing some godly habits in your life. Again, godly habits, that's a very broad term. And you know the things that maybe you should be doing, the things that you have neglected. You know if you want to be transformed, there might be some actions that you need to take. As you do that, habits will be developed and you'll get to reap the benefit of those but here are some things I want you guys to keep in mind when we're talking about developing godly habits. First, start small. Start small. I can't tell you how many students, they, they get excited. Maybe they hear a message like this, and they're like, oh, you know what? I'm going to read my Bible for two hours every day. I'm going to go to church seven days a week. And I'm, I'm like, that's like, I'm cool. That's cool that you're really excited. But I'm like, calm down. Because here's what I know, because I found it to be true for myself. We, we get excited, our, like, we get spiritually motivated, our emotions get going, and we sometimes make these really big, grandiose commitments. And it's not that we are lying, like we generally feel like that's what I want to do, that's what I want to commit to. But it's not realistic. It'd be like if you're like, hey, I want to start working out, so I'm going to go to the gym, and I'm just going to try to bench press 300 pounds. I would be like, uh, that's not smart for you. Um, also, I know, like, you're not going to lift that bar. Like, you're going to sit there and probably be embarrassed in the gym. And what you should do is you should start small with wherever you're at. Whatever is comfortable for you to lift, start there and then work and build at it. And if your goal is bench press 300 pounds, cool, like you can get there. Um, but it's going to start with you being realistic. And a lot of times, at Christians, when we want to develop godly habits, we shoot ourselves in the foot because we start with this unrealistic goal that doesn't make sense. So if you have never read your Bible before, 
you're probably not going to read your Bible for two hours every day. I'm sorry. But you could start with two minutes a day. Or if you are like, I, I can't read, I am the busiest person alive, cool. Then start with two verses a day. That should take you 15 seconds, maybe. But if, if you are doing that, I want to say something you all need to keep in mind. Something is better than nothing. And a lot of times we make some big commitment and then we do nothing because it's not realistic. It was too big. It wasn't a helpful goal. So if you want to develop habits, start small. Don't be discouraged if it seems small. Again, something is better than nothing. That next one, don't get discouraged. In the same way, you can't like plant a seed and expect that you're going to eat the fruit of that tree the next day. Anybody would be like, yeah, of course not. Like, that's dumb, obviously. But we, when we want to start growing, when we want to start developing godly habits, sometimes we do something, you know, hey, I read my Bible for two minutes today, and I feel the same. I'm not a transformed person. Then I, you know, then I went back to whatever. Don't get discouraged. You're not going to be this, like, spiritual ninja overnight. If you honestly want to grow... It's going to be a process. I promise you, as you are taking steps, God is going to be working in you. Absolutely. Even when you don't feel it, even when you don't know it, if you are committed to taking steps, God is going to work in you. Even if it's just cultivating perseverance and endurance, you need that. So it's really important that you don't get discouraged if you don't feel like you're seeing the results you want right away. That's okay. If you, if you um, let's say you're, I'm committed to reading the Bible every day, and then you just forget. You're like, oh, three days have gone by, and I haven't even thought about the Bible. Um, next thing I want to encourage you in is don't disqualify yourself. Because what we do is we're like, hey, I said I was going to do this, but then I skipped a day. And so we're like, Psh, all right, never mind then. I guess I just can't. And we just give up entirely because of one moment of weakness or forgetting or whatever, if you mess up, it doesn't mean that you're not capable. It doesn't mean that you can't keep growing. It doesn't mean that you can't develop godly habits or that you're too whatever. Don't disqualify yourself. If you, if you fall short in whatever your commitment is, that just means that you're a human being and you need God's grace like every single one of us. And then you get up and you keep going. Next thing, set practical goals. Practical means it can be practiced. It is a, a physical, real, tangible goal. Because what happens is we do stuff like this. What is my goal? My goal is I want to grow closer to God. Well, that sounds really cool, but that's just like an abstract, like what does that even mean? How, how do you do that? Um, and we could talk a lot, and we do, about what that looks like, but if you want to set a, a, a goal to help you develop a habit, it should be a step that you can look at and observe and measure. So it might be something like, I want to read two verses a day. That's a goal. I can measure it. Did I read two verses? Yes or no. Oh, it was only one? Whatever. There's a measurement there. I can, I can look at it. I can understand it. But if my goal is I want to be a better person, I can't measure that. I don't know how I'm doing with that. That's just like abstract. And then most of the time we're like, ah, no, nah, it's not happening. Like, never mind. So set practical goals. A goal like I want to go to small group at least three times a month. I want to be committed to going to my group. That's a practical goal. That's something you could look at and measure and understand how am I doing with this? I want to pray at least one time a day. Cool, that's practical. Next thing I want to remind you guys of is to invite accountability. The worst thing that you can do if you want to make changes is keep it to yourself. Invite accountability into your life. If there are things that you want to do or not do, tell people. Your parents, 
would be first and foremost the best resource for this. Why? Because they're interacting with you every day. They know you pretty much better than anyone else in your life um, and are going to have the authority and the freedom to be like, hey, what, like, what about that thing that you said you were going to do? You can talk to friends. Part of one of the benefits of us launching small groups next week is that you're going to have a group of people that you can be real with and talk to. And that would be a perfect environment for something like this, for you to be like, hey, can you guys, can you guys help hold me accountable to whatever the thing is that you're wanting to do? Lastly, routinely evaluate. So if you have a goal, it's practical, uh, you're not getting discouraged, at certain points, you have to be able to look at it and be like, how is this going? Like, what good is, what good is setting a goal if you just never think about it again? Um, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that there's a guy I'm mentoring, and um, one of the things that we said we were going to do uh, this week, and I'm pretty sure he forgot about it because he hasn't texted me back yet, was uh, like, hey, we're going we're gonna to do devotions together and we're going to text each other after we do them. And it had been a couple days and I texted him like, dude, I forgot. Like, did you do them? And I haven't heard back yet. I'm pretty sure it didn't happen. But stopping to look at like, how is this going? Um, what what are we doing? Is, is this working? Is there something I need to change? That's fine. If you need to, if you were like, hey, my goal was that I'm never going to miss a small group ever again, uh, and then I did, maybe it's a good time to like reevaluate, all right, I need to adjust my goal. I thought I was going to read my Bible for two hours a day. Like maybe I need to turn that down a notch. Um, whatever, whatever it is, it's good to evaluate. Is this working? How's it going? If you, if you have invited accountability into your life, it makes it a little bit easier to kind of evaluate, hopefully, of people asking you how stuff's going. I, I would be remiss to not mention the flip side of all this, talking about godly habits, talking about how God will transform you as you're deciding to do these things. You can also develop wicked habits that are going to make it seem impossible to grow and change and mature later. Now, it's never actually impossible, but it is going to seem that way. When you develop the wrong habits, it's going to feel like you can't change and there's nothing you can do. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? No, no, they can't. And it says, so then, in the same way, that's making a comparison, just like that, just like they can't change, then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. The prophet is saying this, Jeremiah is saying, if you get used to, to walking in sin and rebellion, you are not going to do good. Good is not going to be happening. Things like setting godly habits, that's not going to happen in your life because you are going to have developed the habits of walking in sin and rebellion. You're going to be developing some things. Your brain's going to be forming pathways to make it easier and easier and faster and faster for you to sin rather than do the right things. Doesn't mean you can't change. Doesn't mean God can't save and heal and redeem you. Every single sinner in the world that's been saved experiences that, but it's going to be harder for you. It's going to feel tougher. And God's gracious. God helps us in our weakness. But it's just a reality that's worth mentioning. And so we should be careful about what kind of habits am I developing? What kinds of things have I gotten used to? What kind of things do I just run to that I know I shouldn't? Because in the same way we can be transformed to be more like Jesus, those things are transforming us to look less like him. Those things are making us more, uh, more like God's enemy. I want to invite the worship band up here. I'm, I was talking about habits, and I mentioned in order for a habit to form, there has to be, there has to be a cue. There has to be a desire. I, I realize if, if you have no desire to know God, you don't care about him, then developing godly habits is going to mean nothing to you. Why would it? 
Because you don't have, there's not an initial cue or desire to grow or to want the right thing. The cool thing is this, and I say this all the time, it's crazy how much God helps us not only to follow him, he helps us to want him. God helps me to love him because on my own, I don't love him enough and I don't care about him enough and he's not important enough to me. The Holy Spirit literally has to help me to desire the right things. And so I want to tell you, if you know in my heart, I don't really desire godliness. I don't really want that, but I want to want that. Like, I, I wish that desire existed in me rather than me just living in sin and uh, being separated from God. I want to tell you, you can pray for godly desires. You can ask God to change your heart and to change your appetites. And it won't be because I convinced you. It will be a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to do it. He's the only one that can. Your parents can't convince you to want the right things. I could give 100 messages about it, and it's not going to do any difference at all. The Holy Spirit has to awaken our spiritually dead hearts. And it's okay if that's where you're at. I've been there. And in that place where I'm like, God, I need you to come in and do a work because I... I don't desire you. I don't desire these things. Yet I know you're true. I know you have life. And I need your help to even want to start establishing this. We can let our hearts get, the Bible calls it callousness. The same way that you develop a callous on your hands, that rough spot of just dead skin that is kind of unfeeling. You can like stab it. You can grab hot stuff if you have callous on your hands because there's just no nerves. There's no feeling there. Our, the Bible says that our hearts can get calloused. We can get so used to ignoring God and to walking in sin that our hearts become unfeeling towards him. That stuff just doesn't get through. And we need God to remove that. We can't do it on our own. We can invite God to help us, to give us godly desires and the strength and the motivation to pursue him. And so I want to ask you guys, what kind of habits do you want to form? What kinds of ways would you like to grow? What kind of person would you like to be? We want to pray for you. Are there things that you want to break? Are there things that you want to be free from? God's all about that. He desires to do that. And so we want to pray for you. And I want you to know that we're going to have leaders in the back to pray for you guys. Um, as we pray, we're going to invite the presence and the power of God to speak to you so that you might encounter him so that by his power you might be encouraged or motivated or freed or whatever things that you're asking for we're going to invite god to do that and the rest of us we can worship god because he has saved us and helped us some of you guys are already walking in these things you're already developing godly habits and pursuing him because god has helped you and saved you and is working in you we have reason to praise him and glorify him for that. But if you need prayer for anything, even if it's not related to what I talked about, we want to pray for you in the back. And so as we begin to worship, just come back and know all of us leaders will be excited for the opportunity to pray for you. And the rest of us, we're going we're gonna to praise God because he's worthy, because he's good, and he deserves it. Let's worship.